Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today as we talk about summer camp. It's just around the corner. Uh, my name is Anna Sabino. Um, I am a social worker and certified diabetes care and education specialist. But more importantly, I'm also a person living with diabetes. Um, I was diagnosed at six, so was granted uh, the very amazing opportunity to grow up going to diabetes summer camp. And I'm so excited to be able to chat with you all today. Um, and my colleague, Cynthia. Hi, it's so good to be here with you today um, talking about this uh, very important topic. Uh, so I am Cynthia Munoz and I am a pediatric psychologist. I have had the pleasure of working with uh, many young people uh, with type 1 diabetes and families for, gosh, um, more than 20 years now. And uh, um, also had experience, you know, experiences of, you know, going to camp, uh, you know, as a kid and navigating that whole experience. So I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Awesome. Camp is just so special. It really is. Yeah. And I think it really, um, as we probably reflect now, uh, there are so many lessons that we learned um, from the you know, just registering for camp, packing, going through the experience of camp the first time, and then how we probably felt when we went back to camp, now having had, you know, just um, not being the newbies anymore. Absolutely. And I I look back now, I mean, especially I'm, I've obviously aged out of the age of being a camper, but I think it wasn't until even, you know, five, 10 years later recognizing the impact of what those experiences, you know, even just a day camp or a week away, um, even just a weekend away for some of those families who are doing a weekend program, have this like unspoken understanding of awesomeness that everybody around you just gets it. And I think that really just speaks to the true impact of the, the magic of camp. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and even as I'm listening to you say this, I'm thinking to myself, oof, I mean, there's so much we can talk about. When you talked about you know, going to camp and this feeling that is really difficult to describe, but mm. that feeling of it's not just me or I'm not alone or all these other people, you know, are doing some of the same things that, you know, I have been doing. Um that is such a powerful experience. But then it also just reminds me of that connection that, you know, between our emotional experience and that, you know, lived experience with type one diabetes. Yeah, it is. It is insanely powerful. And I think especially for those campers who you know, are, you've never met another person living with diabetes before and to be surrounded by just the normalization of pricking a finger and sort of those like teachable moments where you see another kid have the self-advocacy to just get off the basketball court because they know they're, you know, experiencing a low blood sugar or they need help. Those little moments are those like teachable moments that give the momentum for these kids the rest of the year when they're not necessarily around people who get it 24 seven. And it's, it's the memories and those reminders that are just so extra special. Yeah. You know, and it reminds me about the information that we have about the relationship between our emotional well being or mental yeah. health and diabetes and how people with diabetes can be, you know, higher risk for uh, anxiety, for depression, but also um, it is not uncommon and, you know, probably very understandable um, that feelings of sadness, you know, feelings of frustration or anger, or even just feeling, you know, just, you know, sick and tired, you know, of the daily things into managing blood sugar and how powerful it can be to go to camp and to have this, you know, realization or really just seeing 
you know, that you truly, you know, are not the only one navigating all of these things. Absolutely. And I, I love that you said that too, because it's, it's not only for the, the campers, but it's also for these emerging young leaders in our community, the, the CITs or the leaders in training and, and the staff too, especially as we're still sort of emerging out of this, you know, official end of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic, many camp programs and many, many people across the U.S. and the world too, this is the first time they're ever seeing someone in person with devices and, and the opportunity for them to even have a conversation in person about what it's like for them brings up a lot of emotion and really great connection opportunities to talk about some of the some of those things that are just hidden really deep underneath the emotional skin. Um, and Cynthia, how do we start to begin to have these conversations to prepare families, um, especially some of these first time campers for this this transition? Right. Well, you know, I think it's um, we know that there are many benefits you know, to a camp experience. So the American Association um, has asked its campers a lot of questions to better understand um, what camp was like for them. Yeah. The good news is that from the information that the campers gave, you know, we found out that more than 30% of these campers experienced a decrease or less feelings of anger, less feelings of loneliness, which, you know, is directly related to what, you know, we were just talking about, but also um, feeling less sadness. So when we talk about preparing for camp, I think the starting point really is recognizing or acknowledging the value of camp, how beneficial a camp experience really can be. And not just for kids, like you said, mm -hmm. also for young adults and adults who um, work as counselors in training or CIT, um, who work at camp as you know staff members. Um, also, while maybe um, there are not that many, you know, there are some opportunities for young adults with uh, type one diabetes mm -hmm. to get together in a retreat or camp setting, Absolutely. right? So we know that there are benefits, you know, uh, at many stages of life to have this um, experience of community uh, while you're having fun. Um, so I think that would probably be the first step, right? The value um, and the benefits of a camp experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I, I have my own, you know, private practice virtually, and we talk about, you know, sort of this idea of working backwards and, you know, what is something that you like to do at home that you do really well? And what is something that you would like to try new? Um, because camp is a new experience for mm -hmm. everyone. Um, and I also want to say that I think for parents, acknowledging our own feelings of not necessarily nervousness, but just how excited we are as parents to try something new to acknowledge that it's new, but that we're so excited to experience this as well. Um, makes a world of difference for, for so many families and role modeling their excitement can only help the process. You know, and I would even say that, you know, some people may not experience excitement. Some people might experience, you know, just stress or worries or just wondering what it's going to be like. And, and that can be true for the kids and adults. Right. But yeah. but this is a really good opportunity, even for parents to say, you know what, um, I also am feeling some butterflies or I am also feeling a little, you know, um, worried about going to camp because I've never been. I don't know what this is going to be like, but this is something that we're going to do together. Um, if it's family camp and it's we're literally going to do this together, if it's sleepaway camp or day camp 
you know, for a child or a young person, then it's, um, I am going to be here, you know, um, I'm going to be here, I'm going to be thinking about you and supporting you. And I know that we're going to have a lot of really, you know, cool things to talk about, you know, when you come back. Absolutely. I mean, and there, there are so many sort of like tips and tricks to sort of help get ready. I think especially for overnight campers, if you're going away for the first time, I would, as a parent too, I would practice spending a night away from your child, if at all possible, you know, especially to ease your trust and their confidence in just spending a night away, you know, not in their bed. Um, if it's a sleepover or a night away at grandma's or even in a hotel with you sort of right there, it's just, it's a different experience that they could potentially talk about and relate to as they're mentally adjusting. And as mom or dad are mentally adjusting to that piece of separation, because I think a lot of people think, oh, how are they going to do without me? This is the first time they're away from home. And yes, that's very true. And we also know that it's very normal. Um, and with practice, it, it can really boost that confidence for um, move-in day for camp. And I, I mean, these are, you know, this is a really amazing tip. And, um, you know, let's keep going through, you know, different tips. One thing I would add to what you just said is that, you um, I have conversations with parents and guardians, and I have them thinking about how they're going to spend that time. Because so much time and mental energy can be spent supporting your child um, and looking at, you know, those blood glucose numbers. And, you know, um, sometimes I think, um, you know, there, uh, you don't realize just how much is, how much time and effort is going into that mm -hmm. and well spent, of course, right? It all comes from a place of love and, and um, it's not a negative thing. But when your young person goes to camp, then, you know, there's all this time and mental space that can either be devoted to some self care mm -hmm. um, or it can go into then you know, thinking about or worrying about, you know, your young person at camp and, you know, the reassurance that kids are telling us that they're having positive experiences at camp is a good thing, that they're safe while they're there and there is staff um, that is keeping them safe, um, you know, but also, you know, for a parent thinking back about you know, we hear, we probably talk about this a lot when we when we talk with kids and with families, but, you know, about how important self-care is for parents, right? If you can take care of yourself and you're better able uh, to continue taking good care of your family, including your child with diabetes. Um, so what about the, the technology, though, speaking of, like just- Ooh, that's um, a big one. Different. Yeah, and I I work, I'm sure you do too, with parents all the time about this, you know, it's almost become an addiction, right? To look mm. at blood sugars and, and monitor trends and patterns. And I think what we have to kind of almost remember is that, you know, these are tools um, and, and they're tools. And sometimes it's okay to take a break from from the tools. And and again, I I actually just spoke with a family right before this call who is going to an ADA camp for the first time, very excited. And they're concerned about the access and the Wi-Fi. And my recommendation to them was like almost gradually de-exposing them. Mm. And, and, you know, you obviously need to monitor your child for safety and have alerts turned on, but see if you can start to delegate that to either a spouse or a partner um, and, and slowly take away some of that responsibility uh, just as a practice, even for a few hours a day, or even, even just to build up your own level of trust and confidence. So when you are gone for that, you know, week or you're separated from that data for, you know, five days or sometimes two weeks, it's not so much of a mental shock to the system and always know for parents listening in, yes, you can call a camp and, and check in. And as a former camp counselor, 
we don't want to hear from parents every single day <laughs> at the, you know, at the Ooh. same time. Um, because we as, as, as counselors, their main focus is to keep kids having fun and be safe. And sometimes that the, those parental phone calls can just take away from that focus on enjoying the kid and making sure they're having like the best time. Um, Anna, let's highlight that. Yeah. So what I hear you saying and what I know is true is that the camp counselors, the staff, everybody wants your child to be safe and well at camp, right? Everyone Absolutely. has, you know, the same goal. You know, they want all the campers to have maximum benefit, right, while they're at camp. So they want them to get to know, you know, other young people, um, you know, develop friendships. I know some people that have developed lifelong friendships from camp. Yeah, and, I'm one you know, of them. I had a whole like wedding table of camp guests. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. I have a really good friend and her um, best friend and the uh, minister was somebody she met at camp and you know ah, so right yeah. all these stories right are are um are common so also you know the camp staff of course wants to keep all the campers mm -hmm. safe right because let's think about it would people continue sending their campers to camp if there were something you know unsafe about that place probably not probably. and when we talk about um the ADA camps, these are camps that have been around for many, Decades. many, many, many years. Yes. Right. Absolutely. And we know that, um, you know, campers go back to camp time and time again. And um, another thing that might be helpful when you talk about, um, you know, getting accustomed to what the experience of having your, your child away, uh, preparing for that, um, is also, you know, seeking out other families who've sent their children to the camps and, you know, getting some reassurance that while it is a different experience, that your children will more than likely come back with stories that will have positive impact um, on them for a lifetime. Absolutely. Right. And one thing I wanted to sort of tag on to was that mm -hmm. a lot of people, a lot of parents, you know, they expect their children to come home and be raving about it. And mm. there are, there are some kids that right away may not have this like, oh my God, it was awesome. And we went on this hike and they may not bring this sort of sense of enthusiasm right away that you're yeah. expecting. I love that you are talking about this sense of connection, you know, all year, whether it's through a Facebook group or whatever community you find most, you know, speaks to you, whether it's in person or not. And some people are not the type of people that are on the car ride home going to be verbalizing every single thing that they've experienced. And I think we have to remember that they are still processing kind of what they just went through. This is like their commute home. And we need that time as parents when we're commuting home or walking upstairs from our home office even to just digest our most recent experiences. And one thing that I work on a lot with families is just kind of this idea of, you know, agendaless presence, you know, at the end of the school day or at the end of a experience, we often want to ask our kids about everything. Ooh, how was the field trip? What did you have for lunch today? And a lot of times how was your day? they not want to say anything. How was it? Whoa, that's a loaded question. So mm -hmm. I think, we, you know, it may be months where things about camp start to emerge and nine times out of 10, like you said, Cynthia, they're going to be positive experiences and hopefully ones that will prompt them to maintain that connectivity um, for years to come. Yeah. The other thing uh, to keep in mind is that when you're at camp, uh, you know, especially if this is your first time, um, there is a lot of change in routine. So yes. bedtime might be different. Uh, it might be earlier, it might be later. Um, the time you wake up and, and following, you know, the, the routine throughout the day. So 
I really like, you know, the, the analogy of, you know, um, you know, the moments after work, the moments after a school mm-hmm. day, and how the moments after camp um, are time to process everything, but also, um, it's possible that a child is just coming back, you know, feeling a little spent, um, because they have mm-hmm. just been doing a lot of you know, things that are out of the norm, you know, for the routine that they're accustomed to. Also, I think when you ask, um, you know, a child, like, how did it go? I mean, it's like, where do you start? Um, I know. And to your point, it can take some time, right? Just to start remembering like all the really fun or cool things you want to share. And then of course, there are simply some people, um, including some children who may not be, um, as expressive with their words and describing their experiences. And so, um, you know, there can be other ways um, to talk about, you know, the camp experience. Um, You know, what was one, you know, one positive thing or one thing that you enjoyed or what was one thing, you know, that was very different expect or, um, you know, something like that. It takes me back to even preparing for camp. Um, and like the whole packing experience. Yes. Yeah. Right? And I, I love that you were talking about this sort of just like preparing for home because I have a three and a five year old and there's a lot of preparing. <laughs> there's a lot of preparing. There's a lot of looking, whether it's showing them the website of what pictures of the camp look like, or it is, oh, I wonder what it, what it would be like to shower at camp and asking them some of these sort of open-ended questions or what do you think your bunk is going to look like or do you think we should bring the purple pillowcase or the pink one you know we know in our mental head what are sort of the lists of things we have to bring as parents but giving them some sort of choices to kind of mentally prep about what this might be like you know to them this is like the first day of school so to kind of as parents think about what that mental preparedness process looks like for your kid, the, you know, the week or two leading leading up to it. And again, you know, we talk about this idea of, you know, gradual de-exposure. We want to gradually expose these kids. And and I really encourage parents to, to think about making sure that if you're going away, to, especially to a sleepover camp, that this overnight experience it's not the first time that they're away from home to sort of test what what these things might be like um, to to experience. Absolutely. You know, uh, when you were talking about, you know, the getting ready and the exposing, um, you know, kids to things, it takes me back to <laughs> one of the first times I went to a store um, with my mom, I think it was um, to even shop, you know, for little yeah. things I would need at camp. Um, and whether, you know, you're going to, well, you know, going to a store that has like a section specifically for travel size items, that was the first time I can remember even knowing, you know, that there was a section for, for travel size and what travel size even meant. Um, and then thinking about what am I going to need? Because it, it, you know, as a kid, it wasn't something I thought about like shampoo and like lotion or sunscreen i mean these just batteries for a flashlight Uh, yeah yeah i have to take a sleeping bag or not such a fun experience to go kind of shopping for that kind of stuff and luckily a lot of camp type items are also similar to going to college type items so most of the time if you go to a big store like a target or a costco or cvs even they're very seasonal so they're sort of speaking to you (laughs) from a consumer Mm -hmm. perspective um to make it really fun and then from one other thing that I just want to say is like letter writing and journaling. And even if you don't send, even if the child doesn't end up sending you a letter and you're like, come on, just waiting for that mailman to deliver a letter home. Doesn't mean they're not thinking about you Um, because I was a letterer, letter writer, and some kids were not. And I think we, we can't expect, we can't expect unless we prepare. Um, And so like picking out stamps together, picking out stationery together, even for those first time campers, you know, pre-addressing those envelopes. Um, And then from the parent side, it can be as simple as sending the little postcard or a letter two days before 
um, camp starts. So they get that letter on the first or second day. Um, and I would even just not even encourage too much in the letter. My mom used to write me a card. She read it in cursive in the most beautiful handwriting. And I remember even as a counselor, oh, today I walked the dog and watered the plants. I'm like, I don't care. But I, <laughs> that that's what you did. I know that you did that every day, but it still brought me back to home. It still made me think of home. And, and I still loved receiving the letters, even though she didn't really have much to say. And this was way before cell phones when staff <laughs> communicate even. Um, I still loved being handed that note as an older camper, knowing that she was just walking the dog. <laughs> um, right. And those little reminders of home are are just so special. Absolutely. You know, and I was a, a, I was a shy kid. So my experience of getting um, letters was where the first, you know, time I went to camp, I didn't get a letter and it wasn't um, my parents, you know, also just didn't know the really cool thing that I find now when I go to the websites for camps is that there are checklists. There's, oh, yeah. a, there's a lot of information, right? And so there are a lot of, you know, tips and, and you just mentioned one of them. And that is, you know, for the parents and guardians where you can send a letter in advance, send it a couple oh, days yeah. before, um, then you know that it's more likely going to arrive while your child is still at camp. But you know, my parents got better at that. Like they learned, you know, to do something like that. Um, but hearing those, you know, little things about I'm watering the plants and, you know, we're mowing the lawn. Um, I really actually appreciated that. Maybe it was like, it helped a little bit of that homesickness. Mm -hmm. But speaking mm -hmm. of homesickness, um, boy, am I glad that I stuck it out. Because I can tell you too. in the beginning, it was tough. And I know that I talk with kids and families now and, you know, sometimes parents will get those phone calls, you know, your child is feeling homesick and um, but really encouraging kids to stick it out, but encouraging parents and guardians to support their children mm -hmm. in staying at camp and really having that full experience. Um, it's likely that your child will grow up and will appreciate the fact that they did it. Um, that it, maybe it didn't feel comfortable or it wasn't easy, but they did it. And, and that's something you just can never take away from them. That's a win. That's a huge win. And I think we have to also remember too, that mm -hmm. this is, this is building a sense of, like you said, resiliency that they will look back on for years, even if they only decide that for whatever reason, camp just wasn't for them that one year experience people still talk about oh i only went for one year but it was so great and i was so homesick but i'm so glad i went and nine times out of ten they're going to look back and not remember them being homesick they're going to remember that they had you know dinner on the side of the lake one day or that it was like wear your pajamas to breakfast one day and not necessarily feeling so sad. Um, most of the time, you know, give it a couple of days. It's an adjustment period. Um, but I would also agree, try from a self-care perspective to mentally prepare yourself too as the parent um, and give yourself that confidence and trust as well as, um, you know, instilling that into your kid. And I think the worst thing we can say to our kid is, oh, don't worry if you're sad, I'll come get you. Um, right. I don't know, I, I assume you would agree with that, Cynthia. <laughs> um, That's what I was referring to when I said, yeah. I'm so glad that I, that I stayed yes. uh, because I felt accomplished. And I felt proud of, you know, myself um, for having done something that, that was uncomfortable. Yeah. And I think, you know, as we're wrapping up here, I, what I would love to just instill is that just at the end of the camp experience, or even as you're preparing, let them know how proud you are of them. You know, I'm so proud of you. Like, we can't assume that kids are feeling a certain way, but we can express how we feel about it and hope that they are processing that and and going to experience that, you know, all in one. Um, what would you yeah. say to that, Cynthia? Absolutely. 
I think the messages, you know, as adults that we want to give kids is that um, the adults are going to do what they can, you know, to, you know, make sure you're having a fun time to make sure that you have, you know, a positive experience. And also um, the adults are there to keep you safe. Mm -hmm. And so as adults, parents and the guardians, if you have questions, contact somebody from the camp and ask your questions. But the messages and the things you want to talk about with your child or with your child present are the messages of um, optimism, the messages of this, you know, is, you know, going to be a new experience and everyone involved is going to help you make the best of it. Um, the other thing I would say is that uh, along with all of the other ways to prepare, if going to a camp or a sleepaway camp feels like a jump, this is the value of other things like a step out, a tour to cure, going to other mm -hmm. activities where you're going to meet other kids or other families. And then you can talk about, hey, you know, are, have you been to camp? Are you thinking about going to camp? And it can be just so cool um, to know that you're going and, you know, that you're going to see a familiar face. Absolutely. I think, you know, along the lines of that gradual exposure, it is, you know, yeah, go to that walk, you know, have, find some local ADA Facebook friends and meet up in a park or, you know, whatever it is. So you have that experience to build upon that exposure and that confidence if and when you are ready. And I will also say too, there's really no magical age where, you know, camp is the right age to, to have it be your first year. There are some you know, eight-year-olds who thrive their first year and some 12-year-olds who really struggle to make that adjustment. So it really, you know, when people ask me, oh, do you think my kid's too young? I said, you know your kid. If they are excited and you are excited, then you need to kind of make that gut decision on what works for you and your family. Just like pumps and insulin, no two like prescriptions or basal settings are exactly the same. Yeah. And they change over time, I think, is your is the other point. <laughs> right. So yeah. the way that you feel about something at one age doesn't mean that you're going to feel that way necessarily, like always. Right. Or, you know, and Absolutely. so, you know, even for someone who goes to camp, you know, once and, and they come back thinking, oh, I don't know if I want to do that again. Just the, the realization or the recognition. Right. That as time passes, kids are getting older. Young people are getting older. They're evolving. They're maturing. And so they're perspective changes. And uh, one camp experience that, you know, wasn't exactly what they were ready for or what they were, you know, what they um, wanted um, could be a completely different experience, um, you know, if you try it again, you know, later. So um, that's definitely something to keep in mind. Now, what do we do, you know, when a child is experiencing some of the things we mentioned, you know, when we first started talking today. So we talked about sadness and we talked about anger. Um, and then, you know, we talked about depression, anxiety. So um, feeling sick and tired of, um, or just struggling, right? With um, living with uh, type one diabetes and, and its daily demands, I call it, the, the management. Um, what supports, like how would we link a child or a family with someone like you, um, yeah. someone like me, someone who can yeah. support them. Well, I think, you know, the, the greatest gift of camp is that, you know, it's part of the ADA family. It's part mm -hmm. of the ADA community. And we are so incredibly lucky over the last, you know, 10 years that we have this amazing resource of mental health providers. Um, and many of whom have significant experience, whether it's personally or professionally or both, with diabetes and are and are there for support. Um, all of the staff are they're also trained. You know, yes, many of them are are in high school and college, but a lot of them are trained and recognized on how to kind of pick up on on some of these sort of signs and symptoms and can refer to um, and make suggestions to parents, whether it is through an email or, or a phone call um, on some of these on some of these concerns. Yeah, absolutely. You know, 
one of the things that I've learned over the years is that, um, you know, the ADA has a lot of information um, about type one diabetes in general, um, but also uh, specifically about mental health, emotional well-being, Absolutely. you know, and type one diabetes. And so, um, in fact, um, on the website, the American Diabetes Association has, um, you know, topic of, you know, mental health living with type one. Um, there's another one that's understanding diabetes and mental health. Um, oh. and, and getting back to how you can connect with a therapist um, who has, you know, uh, some working knowledge, so has knowledge about diabetes. Um, the American Diabetes Association has a searchable directory online that anybody can access. So it is the um, ADA a Mental Health Professional Directory. Um, and in this directory, you can search for therapists who are you know, in your area, you can uh, put in your zip code, um, but also you can search for therapists who provide um, telehealth or virtual mm -hmm. um, care. And, um, and usually, um, I know things were different during the pandemic, but typically you want to find a therapist who provides virtual care within the state um, that you live in or that you are in. Um, and so those options um, are also available in the directory where you can find um, people who are knowledgeable and who can provide um, professional support. Absolutely. And this is a tool that has been increasingly popular, obviously, just because of where we've been at with the pandemic and the growing, increasing growing need for more opportunities for connectivity and, and mental health. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I, you know, I, I talk with people um, sometimes when they say like, oh, I have a great therapist and, you know, they're, they, they're familiar, you know, they have some knowledge about, you know, diabetes. And of course it goes without saying that even when you work with a therapist who has knowledge about diabetes, you know, the, th the therapist still wants to learn about your diabetes and you still want to help your therapist better understand your diabetes, right? Because it's, it's slightly different for everyone. Um, in the way that, you know, do you choose, you know, are you using an insulin pump? Are you uh, using, um, you know, the insulin pen or using the in pen, the Dexcom, the Libre, they all kinds of things, language. right? They speak right. the language. They speak the language. And it goes back to that sort of camp piece where it's like this unspoken understanding of when camp is over and you find yourself back in this like sort of cycle of maybe burnout or whatever that that is, you've got somebody there from that professional side who just gets it. I actually love when clients come to me and they say, well, I already see a therapist or our daughter is working with someone, but they don't get diabetes. Yeah. And having someone that does do that is just so reassuring. Absolutely. And if you have a therapist who understands diabetes and they're not in the directory, then you might want to encourage that therapist to join the directory so that other Check people can find Absolutely. them. Right. Um, but you're right with camp, you know, it, it can, you know, really help develop, you know, emotional well-being, connectedness, a sense of community, which is that connectedness. Um, also for children, you know, a sense of um, just, you know, uh, of self and, and identity and how you see yourself, you know, um, in the world as a person with diabetes. Um, and then those other skills that are really just important for, you know, you know, just in life. And that is, um, what do I need, you know, to get myself through the day from waking up to brush my teeth, showering, dressing, you know, and bedtime routine. Um, so there are lots of things to be learned and, and cherished uh, from an experience at camp. I hope everyone that is listening or joined us for a bit will, um, either if you are not already registered, consider um, camp as such an amazing opportunity for both you as the parent and for your kiddo. Um, Cynthia, it's been yeah. such a pleasure to connect with you um, and 
I think, um, I hope everybody has a great summer. Absolutely. And please know that the American Diabetes Association has camps across the country for children with type 1 diabetes. And so I'm grateful to the ADA for being um, the organization that um, has offered these camps over the decades. And I'm hopeful uh, that many of you will be able to um, experience what they are and the changes that they can make in your life and the lives of your children. Absolutely, could not agree more.